Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, my name is Lauren Baddams. I'm an online admissions counselor here at Vermont Law and Graduate School. We're located in South Royalton, Vermont, where it's green today. Um, but in the next few days, it might be white again with some more snow. So um, if you haven't visited campus, reach out to us and we can let you know about the many ways you can do that. Um, either joining us virtually like this or uh, maybe in person on campus. Tonight, my team um, joining me, Veronica Schlerf, Genevieve Nichols, Marnie Avila Alvarez, all of them are amazing resources to help you with questions about our programs, our application process, and how to get um, really all of the, the resources and questions answered that you need to get going. So. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the application process. Now, go ahead and get our presentation going. There we go. Sweet. All right. So, yeah, we're going to be talking really about how to put together a strong application. And we'll be going over the main parts of that application. Uh, so, here's our agenda. We're going to break down each of those parts. And um, my teammates and I will be giving you our tips and tricks for really putting together that strong application, your best foot forward in this next step of uh, pursuing uh, a graduate education and furthering your career. So where I will start, um, let's see, I'll hand it over to my teammate, Marnie. Um, she'll get us started on personal statements. Looks like you're on mute. I'm muted. There you um, go. <laughs> hi, everybody. My name is uh, Marnie Avila, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. I am the um, international and LLM counselor uh, at the uh, LGS of Vermont Long Graduate School, um, and it's a pleasure to um, host you tonight. Um, so tonight I'll be talking um, about uh, personal statements. Um, diversity statements and uh, a little bit further um, letters of recommendation. So um, let's get to it. So the personal statement is um, a great place for you as an applicant to, um, let's check this. I'm sorry, I'm having technical issues, but there we go. So um, as I was saying, the personal statement is a great opportunity for you as an applicant to introduce yourself to the um, admissions committee. So we'd love to hear about your background, your experiences, your goals, and um, your motivations for pursuing our program in our institution. You can also tell your story. Uh, you can start by telling um, your, so your story in a compelling way, highlighting key experiences and achievements all the challenges and um, that you have overcome in your academic and professional journey. Uh, but you can also ch um, show your passion about why you um, are interested in getting um, engaged with our program. So um, this would I mean you could describe and discuss what inspired you, what's your interest, uh, some of your extracurricular activities and your hopes. Um, after you are done with the program. Uh, you can also highlight your achievements um, and also demonstrate what you would be a great fit to be in our institution. Um, you will also like to address some challenges, if uh, any, or any obstacles that you've overcome. Um, and also you would like to be specific and concrete. You wouldn't like to have like a super extensive personal statement. The, Goal of the statement is that we get to know you as an applicant um, and also academically. Um, so I seen that we also have um, a diversity statement that's next on the agenda. Lauren, is that okay if I just jump in? 
Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I, I caught you in line. I put you first. Um, and you did a fantastic job uh, walking through the personal statement. I think it's an important element to call out. I, I totally said I was going to do personal statement and I threw it to you instead. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but I think it's important to note that there won't be an interview uh, for you as an applicant. So really showing who you are in this personal statement can be um just sort of a, a window into your personality and what drives you and what excites you and, and why you're, you're, you're pursuing programs uh, at Vermont Law and Graduate School. So um, that's fantastic. And yes, we'll move next into diversity statement. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, we, we love challenges. That's what, that, that's what makes us um, a unique team. Uh, so going to diversity statements, um, Diversity statement is also a place for us to get to know the applicant, but uh, in a broader way, not just related to their academic or professional goals or background. Um, so you might want to start by um, sharing with the committee your story. Uh, who are you personally and what moves you and motivates you to um, apply to our program and come to Vermont Law Graduate School? You can identify unique experiences that you've had um, um, and this could uh, be any diversity related initiative that you have been part of or engaged in any cross-cultural experiences, any kind of experiences that you think it's valuable to you as an applicant. We would love to hear that from you. Um, maybe you would like to highlight contributions that you've had in the past or um, but you would definitely like to uh, connect with the program values and with our institution values. This is a good place to do that. And uh, again, you will also like to be specific and concrete because again, we wouldn't like um, like a super long diversity statement, but one that it's enough for us to get to know you. Um, this is also a good place for you to demonstrate um, how you've grown and learned through your uh, personal experiences and how those personal experiences are um, also helping you or guiding you in your professional goals. Um, and of course, you would, you would have to be or you would like to be authentic and genuine because that it's you, the person that we want to learn from and the person that we want to get to know um, through this um, statements. And I'm more than happy to um, go back to this topic if we have any other questions. But so far, I think I'll pass it on to my next colleague. That's perfect. Yeah, that's a great reminder. Any questions that are coming up for you as we go through any of these elements of the application, you're welcome to put those questions in the Q&A. Or if you just want to throw a shout out in the chat, that's um, welcomed to, uh, I'd say with the, um, with the diversity statement, um, what we really want to hear about is how you're gonna help contribute to our commitment to, to diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus. So we're so interested to know how individually, what that means for you and how, how that um, will help to um, lift this value um, up in our community as a whole. So thank you so much, Marnie. And next we'll hear from Genevieve on our, um, our resume. Um, Sorry, optional essays. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Slide. No, I think I think that is a really fantastic point that, um, you know, between your personal statement and your diversity statement, those are two really huge, great opportunities for us, our, our um, admissions committee, our teams to learn more about who you are. And, and why you're applying to Vermont Lawn Graduate School, to any of our myriad programs. Um, these optional essays are, are another avenue to help us learn more about you, um, why you are a good fit here, um, why this is this the, your goal for your education, um, you know, how this contributes to your long-term goals. Uh, the optional essay, Again, being optional, I, I, I won't dig too deeply in it unless there's some specific questions about it, um, but they can be on 
uh, any number of topics. Um, occasionally, we will see people submit an optional essay that's related to um, their academic history. Uh, so occasionally, people have spent a long time out of the academic sphere. Uh, say it's been 15, 20, or more years since you were in education. Um, that might be an opportunity to, to dig into your academic history as part of an optional essay. Um, occasionally, students who are straight out of high school, going into undergraduate school, um, face a kind of growing up like so many of us did at that time, if that's when we were going to college, and, and learned a lot of things about schedule and academic management that maybe they didn't know beforehand. And so maybe there are a couple of courses in an undergraduate um, transcript that, that a, a further explanation may be beneficial for. Um, so there, the academic question of optional essay, essays can be really helpful for our committee to understand what, what your academic records may say and how or whether that relates to your academic aptitude today and, and the kind of student you would be here at VLGS. Um, I will make a slight caveat and say, please don't explain your entire transcript course by course by course. That is not what we're looking for in an optional academic essay. Um, but if there were a couple of courses or um, kind of a, a theme of courses that might need some additional um, narrative, that would be very helpful. And we do also have an option for these optional essays where uh, if students have already been involved in some type of, um, I'm going to say advocacy uh, or advocacy organization, um, that that advocacy essay would be a fantastic opportunity to tie in those values that you have already developed, have already begun expressing, and how they would connect to, again, the values here at VLGS. Um, maybe you had been involved with um, something like Teach for America, um, something like AmeriCorps. Um, maybe you have already volunteered um, with organizations for city and county cleanups. Um, those kinds of advocacy related um, opportunities, volunteerism that you may have already been involved with help us to understand, again, just a little bit more about your application about your candidacy and how you would connect here in the fabric of VLGS. Um, so those are that's, those are just a couple of notes on those optional essays. Um, again, they are optional. We call them optional. They are not required. Those first two that Marnie helps to introduce um, are required. Um, and I'll go on to the next one, which is an an additional requirement um, of the uh, your your current professional resume. Um, here in the resume, what we are looking for is um, relatively short and succinct, what people are kind of calling a professional resume these days. Um, the uh, There are a few important things here. Um, and one of the most important is we're looking for um, recent and relevant in your work history. Um, so if you are a person who has been in the professional sphere for 30 years, um, we are not looking for 30 years of, of professional history from you. Everything since high school is not, that's too long of a resume. Um, so you'll definitely want to make sure that that's pared down to experiences that will contribute again to the story that you're telling us about who who you are and how um you know you fit and and contribute here at VLGS. Um so so don't on the complete other side of that, um, I just interrupted my own train of thought, but on the complete other side of, of not being in the fields for 30 years and maybe you're coming to us straight after undergraduate school or you might be in undergrad your undergraduate program right now and went straight there from high school and you don't have an extensive list of you know professional positions on a resume that is something that's that's not only acceptable but quite common um not necessarily something that you should work to hide or or even necessarily address because again between all of the different pieces of materials that you're submitting, that part of the story is quite easy for us to understand. And we're just looking to understand what kinds of um, 
employment or volunteer opportunities you may already be involved in and already spending your valuable time on. Um, I will also comment, and, and I, I think we may have said this already, you definitely want to check everything through and edit every, everything through. Um, it's, it is very important to make sure that you don't have typing or spelling errors in what you're submitting. Um, we, we do look for that. Most anyone will look for that. So do be sure to spend just a little extra time, a little extra attention, making sure that that should say one and not on. Um, lots of spell checks will find the actual errors, but won't necessarily find the grammatical inconsistencies. Uh, so just a, a few extra minutes on these earlier statements on your resume, um, and that can really help uh, deliver a really kind of complete picture that is succinct, I think was a, a word that Marnie was using, um, and and something that will will show us who you are. And I feel like I've said that too many times now. <laughs> That's such a good call out. Um, yeah, the, the nothing says um, a professional polished letter, like um, it, it'd be, you know, being written authentically from you um, in your voice, but um, yeah, w without any spelling errors or typos, um, that's really a good way to put your best foot forward in your application in the diversity statement and the personal statement and in any of those optional essays. Um, have your friend who's really good at grammar um, take a look at this and make sure that they agree that it, it sounds authentically you. Um, and then I think also another sort of second review by someone who doesn't know you, um, did they after reading the, your statements and after looking at your resume, do they feel like they have a really accurate picture of you as an applicant? Um, and maybe they can give you really honest feedback, having not known you personally, um, to know whether you've included everything um, and see if they, um, you know, what their feedback might be. So um, some really helpful review um, steps prior to application will really stand out um, and and help you to, to have that strong application. So. That, that sounds fantastic. Um, with that, we can move over into letters of recommendation unless any of my team has anything else they wanted to touch on before uh, we go there. All right, I think we're all set. Marnie, are you okay to be up again? <laughs> yes, of course. So um, am I muted? No, okay. Um, so letters of recommendation. Um, before jumping into letters of recommendation, there is uh, one tiny piece of information that I would like to add to diversity statements. And I know we already passed that, uh, but I think this one's, um, it served me well uh, when I was also a student. So uh, I just wanted to share that I was um, a student at, uh, at Vermont Law Graduate School myself a few years ago. Um, I was an international student. So when I was filling up my application, um, I made sure I put my international experience, like personal and also academic, but also my background, my international background um, as an international student. And I feel if we have, and I think we do international students in um, the uh, webinar tonight, this could be also very helpful. Um, so I'll be more than happy to address more of those questions, um, but I just wanted to put it out there because I know um, sometimes we have those kind of questions ourselves. So jumping into letters of recommendations. Um, so letters of recommendations are also part of the um, materials that uh, let us know you better. Um, and this time we will get to know you a little bit more through the eyes of your recommender. So we would say you would like to choose wisely a recommender um, who knows you both academically and personally. Like, it's okay if we have a combination of one recommender being a, an academic recommender um, or two academic recommenders and then another recommender that knows you personally or in other uh, areas of your life. So we can have um, all those details that we want to know about you as an applicant. So um, if you have to share some of the uh, prompts of the application, or if you have to explain this to your recommender, that's also okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, make sure, or what we are expecting from a recommendation letter is that get to know you in your academic, but also extracurricular activities. 
Uh, we also want to know more about your goals and your character, your leader skill, your skills. So all of those details are important um, for your recommender to um, be able to note them about you. So we can actually get to know you through their criteria and through their experiences with you, um, either as a student or as any other role in your life. Um, so um, another thing is that um, they can highlight all of the achievements that you have had uh, up to that date in your personal or academic scenario or any other scenario that will make you a great applicant. This is also a great place to highlight those. Um, yeah, I think that is, those are my words of wisdom and experience, uh, but I welcome all of my colleagues to jump in if they want to. And I also welcome any questions. Fantastic. I love record letters of recommendation. I think it's such a, a fun picture into uh, sort of your life and your experience leading up to this point. Um, choosing somebody like Marnie saying who knows you really well, I'd choose that person over someone who has a really fancy title um, and is very important in charge of things, but, but doesn't know a lot of um, your capabilities and the qualities that make you an outstanding scholar. So I would choose, yeah, that that relationship um, with someone, you know, ideally academically. And, and really the reason we want academic references is because you're applying to um, a graduate level program. And so we want to make sure that you are going to be successful in this program. We want to hear about the 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 ways that you've proven that throughout your experience with this recommender um for some people they've been out of school for quite a while so those academic references are not uh super handy and that is okay if somebody can speak to the hard work dedication um and just drive that you exhibit in the workplace or in a volunteer organization that you're incredibly passionate about that's just as strong as an academic reference and probably more fitting for you if you've been, you know, it's been 10, it's been 20 years since you were an undergrad and some of those professors, you know, those connections are, are not as they were as you were, you know, about to graduate. So yeah, I, I think really who you choose is important. Um, and I've honestly, I've, I've spent some time with a lot of students workshopping. Okay, I've been a freelance writer for how many years? Who am I calling on for a recommendation? And, you know, we, we can get creative and help support you in those um and sort of in that way, if, if that would be helpful, feel free to reach out to any of us. At the end of our presentation, we'll be sure to have contact information for all of us so that we can connect and talk um, more. Je uh, Genevieve, it looks like you were going to pop something fun in too. I, I did. I think that's really um, very helpful. It looks like Erica had a question about that. So so exactly on on target. Um, the only other thing I would add, and I think is 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 kind of related to what Marty was saying about you know picking who who you're picking, um, and this may just be my personal experience, but don't be. I would encourage you to 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 not hesitate to ask to draw your recommender's attention to that specific event or project or experience that that you're choosing them for. Don't be shy in pointing out to your recommender, oh, I'm I'm looking at doing this program and, and I chose you as a recommender uh, because of, of the work and research that we did in 2019 that's related to this program. That has an opportunity of priming them to help tell your story the way that you're wanting your story to be told. Um, I've, I've actually spoken with a, a number of different individuals who have been used as recommenders and have heard from them that they appreciate that kind of specific kind of trigger note um, or, or kind of setting an expectation for them. So don't don't be shy in in um, having those conversations like Marnie was saying with those those recommenders. And, and 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 don't worry if it's not academic, if it's been four or five more years since you were in um, your your undergraduate or even just your last academic. You could have been in two or three other master's programs <laughs> since then. Um, and that's that's what I would contribute. Thanks, Lauren. Fantastic. Veronica, do you have anything? Or are you ready to take us into our next topic? Oh, you're on mute. 
I knew one of us would end up doing that. And of course it's me. <laughs> no worries. Um, so there was one thing I did want to, I guess the real takeaway here when it comes to things like letters of recommendation, um, even length of essay, you know, all of these other things is most of these things are guidelines, you know, not, you know, everything really depends on your particular circumstance as to, all right, does it make more sense to have two professional references rather than academic? If you're right out of, you know, normally what we say is if you're right out of undergrad, we tend to want to academic because we believe that's going to present you in the best light. But it could be that you've been working during that time as well, or you have, um, maybe you were doing volunteer work. Maybe that person or a mentor can speak even more succinctly and more clearly in regarding how you would be in this particular program. So again, a lot of these are guidelines. They're kind of tips and tricks um, for you know really creating a strong application because that's your ultimate goal is to be able to present us with a picture of yourself and how doing this program would help you achieve your goals and be successful. Um, that's really what we're looking for. Um, the one thing I, I did want to step back a little bit because I I, I understand that um, the people everybody that's attending at this time for this um, presentation has different interests in terms of different programs. I understand that some of you might be interested in the JD. Um, we also have some people that might be interested in LLM and of course the master's programs. Um, they do have different um, application requirements. You know, if you're looking for a JD, then you have to apply through LSAC. Um, but all these other um, components are part of that. You just have to make sure that you end up going through the LSAC. Um, <clears throat> for an LLM student, you do have an option. You can either use our online VLGS uh, um, application form to apply, or you go through LSAC. We do prefer if you're an international student and you have international credentials, specifically transcripts, that you go through LSAC. Um, again, it's not 100%. You can apply through our online law school portal um, for the application as an international student, but then you have to remember that some of those additional things that LSAC does automatically for you, you'll have to engage another party to be able to get your transcripts evaluated and so forth. And we're going to be going into some of this too in terms of when I start talking about transcripts and what's required. Um, but again, keep those two things in mind that there's two different paths um, when it comes to applying for uh, various programs. Um, so that brings me to, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, that's, that's a fantastic call out. Really, the, the elements that we're digging into tonight are hoping to draw out insights and, and really help you get thinking about these components. Um, but absolutely true, the, the checklist and the actual functional next steps are gonna look a little different whether you're applying to a JD versus when you're applying to one of our master's programs or to our certificate or LLM. So um, know that that's a fantastic thing to recognize. <laughs> and I think, yeah, let's, let's take us into transcripts. The transcripts, I mean, we do prefer electronic transcripts. So um, many schools, I'm, I'm going to even go as far as saying most schools will now do electronic transcripts. They're either going to, you're going to request them and they'll come directly from the school to us, or they'll use some third party vendor such as Parchment, and you can have those transcripts directed to us. Um, and we do require official. Um, we can... Um, review applications sometimes on unofficial, but that's the conversation you should have with your uh, admissions counselor, the person that's working with you. But we can review on unofficial, um, but we would want your official transcripts before potentially starting uh, the program. We need to have that for our records. Uh, the other thing about official transcripts is we do require anything that you've done since your high school. So we don't require high school transcripts Anything after that is required. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions about, you know, well, maybe this certificate, I, you know, do I need to provide a transcript for the certificate? It, it, it kind of depends on when it was done and did you get grades for it? Those type of things. Um, the other question that I sometimes get is do, all right, I earned an associate's degree, um, but that, 
you know, we should probably have the transcripts for the associates. It depends on how you entered the information in your application. If you list some school in your application, you should have a transcript for it. You know, so that's the important thing. Um, if you transferred, you know, or if you took a class or you did a, a study abroad program, typically if those um, grades are listed in, in your degree granting transcript, you don't necessarily have to get a full blown transcript from that other school, okay? So it's just something to be mindful of those, those different pieces of um, transcripts that are gonna be necessary for us to do that evaluation. Now, uh, the other thing, and I kind of touched upon it a little bit, um, if you studied abroad um, or you know, basically received your degree from an international school, then we will require that those transcripts be evaluated. It's basically a course by course evaluation of your transcripts. Um, so, and, the, and it could be that the school might have been in the UK or Australia, even though those transcripts are in, are in English, we still would require them to be evaluated. Um, we use Spantran, WES, ECE are like the three big players um, when it comes to transcript evaluation. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if that's something you have to, you know, do. Um, that's why we tend to recommend going through LSAC instead if you're an LLM or a JD, you know, an LLM student, excuse me. Uh, anybody else want to jump in on transcripts? I was going to say the turnaround time on getting a transcript evaluated can vary. And there's even services where you can pay extra to get that transcript processed really quickly. Um, so to be mindful of the fact that an evaluated transcript will have additional fees associated and may have a larger timetable associated to get everything in. So um, our international students may, be, may want to begin earlier than a, maybe a domestic student because if their transcripts um, have yet to be evaluated, that'll add a little bit of time to the application process for you. Um, and yeah, sort of as Ronica was saying, um, do I need a specific, a separate transcript for this or that? It might be good to have those unofficial copies on hand that you could email us a copy. We could take a look and then be able to give you as accurate um, advice as possible. If this is what I think probably you need to request um, so that we can uh, help you expedite once everything is in, that it's exactly what we need um, in order to get reviewing, um, you know, move it into review. Yeah, and I see, Gabriella, you are asking us to repeat the last part. So, of course, now I'm not quite sure what was exactly the last part. I believe it's the evaluated transcripts uh, for an international student. <laughs> okay, I see. Yes, excellent. So um, what you're basically doing is, is you're going to end up, if you do not go and apply through LSAC, because that service is provided by them, if you go and apply using our online Vermont Law and Graduate School application form, then you're gonna actually have to contact um, a number of, one of these companies, either Spantran, WES, or ECE, and then request that your transcripts be evaluated course by course. Um, and, what they're then going to do, you're going to have your transcripts sent to them. That's usually how that works. You pay them a fee, um, and then you send their uh, the transcripts to them, and then they're going to send us an evaluation of your transcripts. They're basically going to interpret your transcripts so that they compare to the English, um, to the United States um, education system. So we're going to know, like, if you did an LLB, all right, that equals a JD comparable degree or something similar, you know? So that's the purpose for doing it, but it is um, a, a step that is required. And it's probably one of the biggest things that holds up international students. Um, so definitely work with Marnie and get her assistance when it comes to evaluated transcripts if you have more questions. We also can put in the link in our website and um, you can get some more information on our Web page that's for international students as well. I just wanted to add, thank you, Veronica. I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, so um, evaluator evaluation trans transcripts, I'm sorry, are um, 
a required part of your application. So this is not um, something that we can waive. Um, so, and I'm also seeing how important are the transcripts if they're over 20 years old. If you are applying, we will we would need your transcripts uh, and we will need them evaluated if you are an international student or if you completed your education in a non-American um, institution. Um, so I also want to pass um, a tip, a piece of information, and I used used it for myself. Um, so it's also a personal experience. I um, I like to recommend, or we like to recommend Spantron, and the only reason is because they would take your uh, virtual copies of your transcripts instead of requesting your official documents. So I understand that for international students, um, it can be extra challenging to send your only copies or your official copies of your uh, documents. So um, I just wanted you to let you know that Spantron would take um, virtual copies of them. The only requ uh, requirement is that uh, the pictures that you sent, they have to be um, very well. You can you need to see them very well. But other than that, um, they will take them. And I know it makes a difference when it comes to international students. Thanks, Bernie. The other thing I'll say really quick and, you know, I do see Alexandra. I'm acknowledging you know, uh, how, your question: How important are transcripts if they're over 20 years old? Um, part of it has to do with our accreditation that we have to have. If you're a master's student, we have to have your official transcripts from your undergrad, your bachelor's degree. Um, so it doesn't matter how long ago they were. Now, in the actual um, evaluation, in the decision making, in terms of acceptance into the program. Um, that's going to weigh less. You know, what you did 20 years ago, of course, is not going to have the same weight. You know, we're going to be looking at your resume. We're going to be looking at your essays, letters of recommendation. We do look at every single component of the application. So, you know, we do keep that in mind that, yeah, hey, I wasn't the best student 20 years ago when I went to school. So it's actually probably a little bit longer than that. So I would probably even write an academic little statement saying, hey, this is what I, I did as an undergrad many years ago, but it's not a true reflection of my ability to be successful in the program. So, yeah. <laughs> Sort of to add to that, sort of the complexities of this transcript piece, uh, who knew this was, um, you know, just, really, there are sort of a lot of complexities, though. Um, there are some individuals who've attended an institution that no longer exists or that doesn't keep records for a specific length of time. And, and maybe that time has passed. So in those situations, our advice would be reach out to us so that we know exactly what's going on with your application and complicated situations like a university closing or um, records no longer being kept after a certain length of time. Um, so sort of like what you said earlier, Veronica, some of these are guidelines and I really think connecting with us so that we have the full scoop on you know whatever might be um a little more out of the ordinary will really help us to inform you, get answers you need, and help you get your application moving. Yeah, yeah, great point. All right, shall we jump to the next one? Let's talk about test scores. Yay, tests. <laughs> All right, so LSAT and GRE. Now, I, I do know that there's, I think, a handful of people that are applying for the JD program. The JD program does require an LSAT score or just this year, I believe, is now we're starting to accept the GRE instead. Um, so as a J again, as a JD student, those uh, one of those scores is required as part of the application. Um, for the master's, uh, not a requirement. Um, you would definitely not take the LSAT. Um, and the GRE is an optional one for you. Um, Personally, I don't recommend taking it if you're, especially if you're only applying to schools, whether it's just us or you're applying to other schools that don't require it. Um, it's not usually something that's really necessary to do. And I don't recommend putting yourself through that. Um, there might be, you know, again, the case by case, but definitely for us, it's really usually not a strong indicator in terms of somebody's ability to be successful in the program, which is one of the reasons why we don't require it. Um, the other thing that's not mentioned on tests, I do want to just point it out really quick. And um, 
Again, this is more for international students. Um, please keep in mind that there is an English proficiency requirement. Uh, so we do accept a number of tests. So if you're in that situation where English is not your primary language, then um, you're going to probably look at either there's like four different tests. And I just learned recently that we also do accept Duolingo, I believe it's called. So that could be another option as well, which I believe is much more accessible for uh, international students to be able to take that test. Um, and that's pretty much it when it comes to test scores. We do want those sent um, directly to us, so we should not be receiving copies directly from you. Um, they should be sent to us directly. Another point I'll make on this LSAT GRE section, for JD students specifically, if you took the LSAT and the GRE, whenever you submit your scores, both your LSAT and your GRE scores will be listed in the application. You don't get to pick one over the other. So some folks are disappointed by that, um, but I think it's a good call out um, just so you're aware that both of those get um, submitted in the application when you're applying through LSAC. Um, so being mindful of that and um, yeah, fantastic call out on, on the um, English language proficiency scoring. Um, our website has a lot of really good um, benchmarks of this, you know, this is where your score should fall in. And of course, Marnie will be uh, the mecca for information about all things international as an international student herself and an alumni of our LLM program. Um, oh, fantastic. She's already got you in the chat going with answers that you need. Um, Excellent. So we will talk quickly about some deadlines and then go into any questions that we haven't quite covered just yet. Um, so I'll take us through our deadlines. So for residential programming, masters, JDD, JD and LLM, um, as well as our online hybrid JD application deadline, April 15th. And then for our online students, um, so the, both our for our master's, LLM, and our certificate programs, there is a full start. Um, but prior to that, um, actually coming up pretty soon, is the summer start. Um, and you can start actually uh, during three um, three of the, each of the semesters, so spring, summer, and fall. And I don't have next spring's uh, deadline up here yet because we just are sort of wrapping up spring semester currently. Um, but maybe this webinar is something that you're attending to plan for next year and these deadlines are maybe not super pertinent or maybe you're hoping to get everything in in the next two weeks. Um, so be sure to reach out to us as we are um, you know, happy to, to help you with any of the pain points here. Looks like, um, yeah, we've got some questions. So maybe we'll move right into that. Um, yeah. That section, I'll have our contact info up here um, to help with uh, connecting with all of us. Um, yeah, so let's let's get into questions. If um, if I miss anything, team, let me know. Um, okay, so do dual degree students typically start in the summer or in the fall? Wow, that is a good question. So with our dual degree programs. Um, so that would mean that you're taking potentially a program, you're doing a program with VLGS as well as another partnering institution. And um, let's say you're doing a JD somewhere else and you're doing a master's with us, that, um, that master's programming is going to take place in the summer. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone. Um, but that's, um, so that's sort of when you'd be joining us on campus. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that would that would be summer for that. And applications open. So the 2024 application currently is open. And our 2025 application, October, does that sound right, Genevieve? Okay, she's nodding that I'm correct there. Okay, fantastic. Um, and it can be September for um, the JD typically, and if they're going through LSAC, it's usually September 1st, right around there. Um, and we might be opening up the master's a little bit earlier too, instead of waiting until October 1st, but so more to come. 
<laughs> September, October is when your 2025 <laughs> application should be ready. The LLM programs we have are available completely online. Um, we have a number of really amazing um, specialty areas of focus. Gabrielle, if you want to share what, what area might pique your interest most, I'd love to hear about it. Um, so let's see, a program in which a student receives a JD and a master's from GL VLGS. Oh, so um, of course we have a different name for it. It's a joint degree. So that means you're earning both a JD and a master's at Vermont Law and Graduate School. And in that case, you are completing your JD courses in the fall and spring, and then you're completing your master's courses in the summer. Um, yeah, there's different opportunities there too. Um, it Like some people have started their master's ahead, you know, so if you're in a situation where you're like, well, you wanna get going, um, you could potentially start your master's earlier um, and that's definitely possible, but then you switch over because the curriculum for the JD is very structured. So your first two semesters for your JD are, are given to you. So you don't have a lot of wiggle room there. So, but you could potentially start your master's in the first summer, you know, before you start your JD, um, and then continue in it. And then the following summer, you know, so it is possible to flip that around, but it definitely will be, um, in the summer. Yeah, not a lot of flexibility beyond, beyond that. I do, I, I wanna skip over a, a quick question here um, down to, it looks like Gabrielle La, I may have just mispronounced your name. Um, you have a specific interest in the LLM and American Legal Studies. So despite the fact that we do, we do have many LLM programs that can be uh, completed com absolutely online without having to come to our campus. The LLM in American Legal Studies does, it is the one LLM that has a residency requirement. You do have to be on campus in order to pursue that program um, for a number of different reasons. Um, but but given your engagement tonight, I would, I would absolutely see you as a candidate to chat with Marnie individually about our LLM programs. I know she's put our, her information in the chat here a couple of times, uh, but that is the one that you do have to be on campus for. Um, the, the uh, it looks like, I can't see this. There's a question about um, something counting with the JD LLM. Did I miss that reference? That being our joint degree where you're getting both here at VLGS and those deadlines are the same deadlines. Those application deadlines are the same application deadlines for our, our traditional fall start, um, which is related to one of the questions we had in our Q&A. We have a number of different deadlines, um, unfortunately, for our keeping everything straight in our minds. Um, but our April 15 deadline here coming up two weeks is the priority decision deadline. Um, we do have later deadlines uh, that that we consider as space available deadlines. So um, specific to the hybrid, we have a couple, we, we have a very hard cap given to us by the ABA as to how many students we can admit to and start each cycle into our online hybrid JD. And um, the, the, when when that class is full, that class is full and we can't admit any further students. So while we do have an August 1 space available deadline for our fall starts, um, it, I would encourage anybody who's considering starting here, whether it's online or in person or hybrid, um, to apply well in advance of that in order to have your kind of best decision available um, and your opportunity to make your best decisions. Um, the question was, thank you, Tremaine, to um, whether the J joint degree can be completed in three years. And that answer is yes, it's absolutely possible to complete a JD LLM um, at VLGS in those three years. Um, most students will do it with a joint master's degree. So getting the master's version of the LLM instead of the LLM version of it, that's literally just a credentials thing. Um, but yes, can be completed within that three calendar year period. I know I just kind of took over those question chats, um, but these have been some really great questions so far. Yeah, I think we're, 
were relatively caught up with. I was just scrolling through and seeing if we got got to everyone's questions so far. And it seems like we're about there um, with. Ooh, some questions about the online hybrid JD. Um, so in order to, um, to complete the online hybrid JD program, you do actually follow a rather regimented schedule to make this all happen, to make those residencies work and to all meet the standards the APA um, has in place in order to accredit our online hybrid JD program. So I would say the length of it is, um, kind of exactly as it is designed uh, in in order to fit everything in in the prescribed time um, that is needed. So um, in terms of options to potentially expand the length of time you may be pursuing a JD, something you might consider a redu reduced residency program, which would mean you're on campus, um, but would uh, shorten the amount of time you're on campus and help lengthen the total amount of time you're taking courses. Um, and then um, an extended uh, JD option may also be something, uh, but would be more geared toward being uh, residential on campus for a portion of that JD program. Yeah, so unfortunately online, not as flexible with length. Yeah, the online hybrid JD is, yeah, like Lauren said, it's very structured. You're really working through it with a cohort. So it's really hard to um, create that kind of flexibility to, you know, basically stop or take a smaller, you're pretty much at a fixed workload for that time period. Now, I do recommend that we'll have you um, connect with um, Shirley Crawford Hop Hopner Crawford, and um, she can actually um, give you some more specific advice regarding the program and actually let you know what may or may not be helpful. So I don't know in your particular situation. I mean, there definitely are other options. You know, that's the one thing with the online hybrid JD that I think is fantastic. You can actually do a program primarily online with just some three short residential components, but it does take a long three and a half year commitment. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the other hand, you know, the reduced residency JD that um, was mentioned before, you know, basically you can be on campus for one year, if it's your first year, full year, and then the remaining courses you're usually done in a, like an externship is typically required as well as, and that can be done in a variety of locations, it could be done where you're located, um, and then um, online learning. So it really um, changes or some people choose to do an accelerated and just get it done in two years. So there's a lot of different options and hopefully one of them works for you. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the beautiful things um, that Genevieve mentioned about that online hybrid JD cohort is the bond that you form, um, mm -hmm. even though you're not sitting next to each other in class, like our residential JD students would be, um, you are working through that three and a half year program together as a cohort, um, really a cohesive unit learning together and working together. So um, there are some great benefits to that structure um, to allow you to all have those shared experiences throughout that three and a half year program and um, and just to see each other, you know, several times throughout that um, and connect in person. And anyone that is having to log off and maybe wants to catch anything that they've missed, don't worry, we'll be recording the session and we'll send it out tomorrow so you can, um, Rewatch any sections that you want to replay um, or share it with your friends that didn't get to attend. <laughs> we do. I want to draw our attention to the chat here really quickly. Back to letters of recommendation. We, we do require two letters of recommendation. We do want at least one of them to be professional. Um, but Amy's asked, can, can I invite another recommender, maybe a volunteer or internship supervisor to also submit a letter of recommendation? Um, and Amy, that answer is yes, <laughs> you absolutely can. We can accept more than two letters of recommendation, but that's that's that for the requirement is at least two. And if you are a student who who really does only want to submit two and not submit beyond those two required, um, you can make the determination whether whether your application is stronger with two academic 
recommenders or if your application is stronger with that that primary academic recommender and this supervisor or of uh, your internship or a volunteer organization that that you are um, already working with. So there's a couple of different aspects of flexibility there, Amy, that that I hope you know, can can be helpful. Um, you can submit all three, and you can also submit um, one prof one uh, academic and the other professional. And I don't. I guess I. I don't know if you're all okay with me speaking for all of us, but all of us love to talk a good application strategy of what do you think the best way to position this or that is. So, contact us and ask us, and we'll love to talk about it and help you. Um, you know, put the best plan together. Fantastic. Well, it seems like we are just nearly at time. Um, so I will um, invite you to reach out and promise that we'll be following up with the recording and links to contact us and ask us any questions moving forward. We hope to um, see your application soon, help you put those together. Next Tuesday, we'll be holding a Master of Public Policy webinar. If you're curious about what this new degree looks like, join us, sign up, um, and, and register to attend and see you next Tuesday, possibly. So and with that more point, yeah, go for it. Um, right now, we are waiving the application fee for anyone that submits a master's or LLM application. If you apply through LSAC, um, please reach out to us and we'll send you a fee waiver code for that $60 application fee. Absolutely. Thank you for calling that up. That's perfect. <laughs> Great news. <laughs> I forgot about that part. <laughs> Should have led with it. Okay, yeah. great. Well, we hope you all have a great rest of your morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time it might be where you are and hope to see everyone very soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.